posting the video of me uh, basically giving a presentation like you guys will. Well, uh -huh. it's online for your perusal now, including the slide in the video. You, you can access it. Oh, thanks, man. Okay, I have a question about that. I have an answer. So, on the Excel thing, can you just do that with Excel Sheets or do you have to do it on the Excel? Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. Can you help like, us print that out? Can you see? Oh, yeah. oh they're sending it to you? Nope. 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 Not part of the project. Okay. You don't have to do that? Well, you kind of do. But here's the thing. Each of those categories needs to be tabulated, right? Once you have it set up in that particular way, it does all the calculations for you. Oh, so that's why I have to do that. Something makes it easier. Hmm? The other reason I'm going to be on for and honest is to help you in real life. Because whenever you guys start living on your own, which might seem like that's, that's so far away, it's not. Freshman year's almost over. In three more years' time, you're gone. You guys are going to be living on your own. That's which is really, really, really fast. I'm going to college. 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 I'm going to it's something that everybody needs to do, yet few people do, largely because they don't know how to, or because it's so hard. It's just so hard to know when things go. So I'm going to do it right now. You, know? you guys can do this and calculate as, as you go on. So it's no big look. That's so dope because most people just think you're about the most important stuff. They weren't actually learning stuff. Well, well here, here's the thing about that. Here's a, let's, 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 let's be real. Let's talk real, right? Let's talk real. Let's super real, right? Real talk. Alright. What am I teaching that you're going to use in your real career? Probably nothing. Unless you're going to be like a UN diplomat or you know, in geography. Probably not much. But what are you learning that you might use later on? Like sell things for practicing. Well, mm, yes, true. But also consider how you're writing, how you think. How do you know how to write? You can not really terribly great at that, just saying, like, now write this, now write this. Not even great at this. Largely, you're what you do. It's practice, it's a skill like anything else, right? So you're getting the basic set of skills, okay? Whenever you go on to do a job, right, they're going to expect you to have a certain skill set. Everything builds on everything else. For instance, uh, if you go to college, you get a degree, odds are good that degree is going to have really not much to do with what you're actually going to do with yourself. Uh, unless it's something like really, really specific, uh, like accounting or something like that, odds are good it's going to give you a lot of skill sets that will then help you learn what the job is you're going to do. That's why they have entry level positions that teach you the job while you're working. But in order for you to even begin there, you have to know a certain amount of stuff that you learn in college. But to do the stuff in college, you have to learn high school. To do this in high school, you have to learn grade school, et cetera, et cetera. It all builds on each other. So while it might seem pointless now, in the grand scheme of things, it actually fits in. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. This is the long term. Sure so the other thing to consider is we don't seem to do a lot of like, hands-on kind of stuff here because presentations, what kind of school do? College prep is the word. Presentation Academy College Prep School. In essence, we're prepping you for college. All the stuff you can do well in college. If we have done our job well, your first year of college is going to have to have this is easy. True story. No, it's never oh, it totally is. Really? Oh, yeah. I remember my first year in college, I was like exempt from finals because I knew everything from when I was at St. Anne's. And let me tell you, I wasn't the best student at St. Anne's. Or it's just No, that's my point. <laughs> That's, that, that's, that's precisely my point. Hey, no. sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm smart. Yeah. Oh. oh, you just take the call to me. So, my point is, is that uh, that's what we try to do. I've had many students come back and tell me, it's like, oh, yeah, I already did all everything. So, why can you just agree? Really? That's what we want. Because you've got enough stress with switching over to college. Yeah. So, this is my you reason. Do you know? So, today we are talking about after we've done. Unless you guys have more questions about your project. Um, um, I mean, I mean watching the video will probably answer most of your questions.
recorded once. And I'm not gonna lie, I had to re I had to record it twice. The first time I was, I so ran out of time it was unbelievable. Uh, like people are like, five minutes to hard five minutes, I'm like, dude, I could probably talk for ten minutes straight to start this budget. I had to cut stuff off like way, way, way off. And as it stands, I finished at five minutes fifty-seven seconds. And that was the erection. So my point is, is if you've done your research, it, it's really yeah. easy. It's really easy, easy. So just just watch the video, look at the PowerPoint I've provided, and you guys can work out. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. All right. Any other questions about it before we move on? Okay. So we are looking at culture. Yes. Region culture. And first off, let me tell you this: Africa is a vast cultural amalgamation. It's it's something that is really really hard to even begin to cover because it's so incredibly diverse. It is the big mix. Big different groups. This also is is problematic because this area was colonized. Um, it means that their culture was more or less suppressed for hundreds of years. Uh, it was outright banned in some places for them to even speak their native languages. Now, for the most part, some of these cultural traditions were saved, but many were lost as well. And with that went history. So, as a general rule of thumb, uh, history is going to be divided into three categories uh, the Age of Kingdoms or sometimes called the pre-colonial era, the colonial era, and the modern era. And so first off, understand that Africa, as we think about it with these different countries set up, did not look like that at all for much of its history. You had different large empires that arose during different times. Some of them gained their power through military conquest. For instance, the Zulu, if you've heard of them, the southern part of Africa. They went, there's the Zulu tribe. They were pretty cool individuals. Uh, that being said, um, they were cool unless you got conquered by them, and it was pretty bad, um, regardless. Uh, other empires gained prevalence through trade, such as Ghana and the Songhai. Uh, both of these were along established trade routes throughout the north of Africa and, and had gold in their uh, their empire, gold reserves. You know. So they could literally mine wealth and use that to enrich themselves. Of course, you guys know the ancient Egyptians, if you've done any study about that culture, uh, was another tremendous culture in Africa. And then, you know, there are many others that we can think of. Because Jaw is another one. Um, and Jotoro is another. Uh, the point is, this was an era of kingdoms. Uh, many of them were incredibly powerful. Uh, they had their own cultural traditions, their own languages, their own alliances, everything else like that. And initially, the Europeans had no real interest going into the interior of Africa. Initially, the first settling that Europeans did in Africa were in outposts. An outpost is sort of like a fort. You know, it's 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 a little teeny tiny uh, town essentially with the big walls. And it, its essential purpose was to act as a refueling station for ships as they were trying to go around the tip of Africa. You guys know uh, Vasco da Gama? Vasco da Gama was the guy who made it all the way around uh, Cape Horn, or, uh, excuse me, Cape of Good Hope, uh, all the way around uh, to India. Uh, this was the Portuguese expansion trying to get around the Arabs and everybody else on the Silk Road and tap into the delicious, delicious spice market that exists in Asia. So, they had these little outposts because water and food only lasts so long. Uh, fact is, without refrigeration, there's really only a few ways you can preserve food. One of which is pickling, another is drying and smoking, and then another involves boots. Uh, all these strategy boots. Oh, what? Like alcohol, oh. yeah. Uh, well, because consider beer and bread are essentially identical. Uh, it's just that one's a liquid and alcoholic, and the other is a solid. The solid goes bad a lot faster, by the way. Uh, how much faster? Well, consider this: if you have 
just homemade bread, no preservatives, just you made it yourself, you're maybe getting like five or six days out of that before this starts melting in this place, right? So what about beer? Well, what about beer? There was a guy, or rather a team of guys, that found a barrel of beer in a shipwreck uh, that was for a pirate ship. And they cracked it open and it was still good. They drank it. Because, you know, that's what you do when you find, you know, a barrel of beer in the bottom of the ocean. You drink it. Well, they did analyze it and figure out what was in it. And then they can remake it. In fact, you can find it. It's all black and white for you. But regardless, uh, this is another way of preserving food. So sailors need lots of fresh supplies. The biggest problem was water. I mean, if you think about it, the, the salt water around, you can't drink it. So it's kind of ironic to think about it. you're on water, but it's essentially a desert. <laughs> So you need water, right? So stopping over these outposts gave you a way of resupplying. But beyond that, like the interior was scary. We didn't go there. That's that's where where, where where there were lions and tigers and all kinds of scary actually. Yeah, that's true. Uh it's it's a scary place, you know, you don't you don't want to go there. So they did until later when the industrial revolution when industrialization set in, you had a lot of machines available to Produce things at a much faster rate. That meant that prices went down, quality went up, things were great. But the amount of raw materials needed to fuel these new machines just skyrocketed. So they needed resources. And Africa, as we said, is rich in raw materials. So the colonists came in and started exporting all of the raw materials from these colonies. The other thing that we don't think about, though, is labor, the transatlantic slave trade. This actually is before the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution's 1800s. The transatlantic slave trade really gets going around the 16th century. So we're going to have a lot of stuff happening. The forced migration of people unlike anything the world has ever seen. In fact, there are two great migrations in Africa's history. The largest and most significant is the Bantu migration, which is essentially where all culture in Africa came from. One people called the Bantu. Most languages are based on Bantu. It's the biggest language family in Africa. The other, of course, is the transatlantic slave trade. I'm going to ask you a question real quick, okay? What effect this is going to have on Africa? If you are a slave buyer, you're going to buy yourself a slave, what characteristics do you want in a slave? One to be strong. Good. What else? Well, that's, I mean, we can teach anybody obedience, right? You want them dumb or you want them smart? Well, I mean, like, do you want them, let's start kind of where they know how to work machines, like, you don't want them to be, like, in for themselves. Well, you, you, you actually do want them smart. You do want them to be dumb, so I'll tell you why. Because that, most everyone says that, right? You want, you want a slave that doesn't know it's a, here's the thing, an, an industrious slave, one who can think about somebody who may be even smarter than you are, can figure out how to run the establishment. You start giving them a little bit more stuff, make their life a little bit nice than everybody else, not too much, just enough then they will actually use that to raise themselves up. Here's what I have to do, uh, who was literally nicknamed the Prince. His, his real name was um, uh, Abdul Rahman, I believe is what his name was, uh, who was a prince from Joan, who was basically captured and sold. And basically, uh, he told everybody, he said, look, I, I, I'm a prince. If you tell my father, he will pay me five times whatever you bought me for. And everyone was just kind of laughing and everything like that, like whatever they nicknamed in France in like 10 years, 20 years, whatever it turns out, like, oh, she is. But they found he was telling the truth the whole time. And instead of like letting him free, the master just kind of laughed. So I guess I don't want to France. It's kind of sad. And actually, the guy ended up uh, getting his freedom. And it, like, he's got a really wild story to look him up. But uh, anyway. That sort of thing is very common. So what effect does this have? Well, you're looking for the healthiest, the youngest, the best, the brightest, the strongest, everything. Essentially, the cream of the crop are getting exported for hundreds of years out of the country. What impact does it have on the economy of the country? It's tremendously depressing. I don't mean this makes everyone very sad. I mean, it just grinds everything to a halt. And to this day, the countries of Africa, many of them have problems uh, with their economy. So it's tied to that. The other thing has to do with the Berlin Conference of 1884. Here's what happened. A bunch of white dudes met in a room and decided the fate of Africa. Not a single African was invited, right? 
here's what happens. The various powers of Europe, the various empires, were looking at Africa and said, man, I need that. I want some of that action. But so did everybody else. And so there was a threat of war between France and England and Prussia and all these major powerful entities. And so they basically sat down and said, OK, there's no need for war here. Let's carve it up like a giant pie. You get a certain piece, you get a certain piece. And they divide it out. And when they were doing this, they specifically made it so that the territory that, like, say, the French controlled had tribes that were enemies. They ignored tribal lines, and they did that for a reason. They knew that if they were to conquer this area, they could not risk the tribes siding against the Europeans. They, they could lose that part. So instead, they made certain that they had two tribes that were enemies so they wouldn't link up, and it was the policy of divide and conquer. So Africa was divided up, and we have the creation of more or less the same territories that we have in Africa to this day. So remember that. When we start to talk about the problems that the various peoples in Africa face with unity, this is why. It's because it goes back to this original uh, situation. So historically speaking, we go into the last part of their history going into the 20th century. At the end of the First and Second World War, many of these African nations start gaining their independence. And from there, they try to establish functioning democracies. But because there's all these tribal identities there, it makes getting people working together very, very difficult. I mean, think about how hard it is in the United States to get Republicans and Democrats to agree on anything, right? And they've only been adversaries politically for maybe 100 years, something like that, for the other political parties. Even if you say that some semblance of them existed all the way back to the Whigs, going back to the foundation of the United States, we're only talking uh, a tad over 200 years worth of history. You know, I mean, not quite 200 years, as opposed to hundreds, maybe thousands of years of difficulty working within tribes. So how do you make democracy function in a situation like this? And that's a really tough question. I mean, the easy answer is economics. If you can make certain that everybody, their standard of living rises and that they're having a good life, they're less likely to get really that riled up about it. I mean, yeah, they still might complain about stuff on Facebook, but they're not going to like, you know, literally fight a civil war over it. On the other hand, how do you have economic stability when you can't even get the government to function properly? So it's a really, really difficult situation, as you could imagine. That being said, many countries in Africa are succeeding. I mean, all you ever really hear about in Africa is the bad stuff. That's, that's not all there is to it. Not even close. There's some really nice cities in Africa, not just South Africa either. So, one of the aspects of African culture today is that most Africans are multilingual, speaking multiple languages. Uh, in many of these places, uh, European languages have more or less become sort of the, the unifying language, although the north of Africa tends to be mostly Arabic as the unifying uh, culture because of the significant number of Muslims in that area of the world. Uh, tribal identity is incredibly important to the average African citizen. Now, a tribe is what again? What would you say a tribe was? It's everyone. It's uh, everyone from like your ancestors, like your family tree. That can tie back to one ancestor, yes. So you got that idea. So everybody who identifies that family history is going to be close to someone you can rely upon. Other people are questionable. Might be enemies, might be friends, don't really know. And in some of these places, there's traditional ways of telling who is who. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the more controversial traditions in some African peoples is the process of scarification. Are you guys familiar with that? Scarification is? Yeah. Similar, yeah. Uh, it's where you make patterns in the skin by slicing it so that it scars in a specific pattern. Uh, when children are born, uh, this is more or less their baptism in their culture. It's having their face scarred up. 
and so that other people will recognize them. Um, that might seem to be really cruel to us, but that is just part of their culture. Yeah? I think it's not like a, it's like a positive thing, it's not like a, I think they're hurting them or anything. Oh, they're definitely hurting them. I mean, not like, but like, they're not considering it to like, cause Yeah, they're not torturing them. In uh, fact, the mothers who have done are, 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 it's really hard on them to have it done. But this is the question of, if you don't do it, they're not part of the tribe, they're going to be ostracized for their entire life. So, uh, ostracized essentially cast out of society. So, it is definitely something that is becoming less common, um, but is part of traditional culture. So, it's kind of a scarification. Now, the other thing is that many of these different peoples are what you call stateless society. There might be a government, but they don't rely on government to get things done. They rely on family. Specifically, the oldest male is in charge of everything. Uh, basically, the oldest guy used to make decisions. They have all the nicest things. And who has more or less de facto lords of their family? Um, this it is another thing that makes democracy difficult, actually, because if you think about it, this is the traditional power base, is just being old. But being old is no guarantee for being competent or being fair or even being very smart. Certainly some are, but that doesn't guarantee anything. A democracy, at least in theory, is supposed to generate the best leader for the job. So how can you do that with these other folks still being in charge of these areas? The answer is it's very, very difficult. Uh, the other thing that's a problem is, again, what happens if a tribal enemy leads up in position of power over a country? You know, how are you supposed to make that work? Uh, today, culture is mostly a mix of Western and traditional African values. Let me explain that concept for a second. When I say the West, and this is a capital W, I'm not talking about the direction things. I mean European culture, uh, the Western culture, as opposed to Eastern, which would be more like Asian. Okay? So, Western culture, Western ideals, mixed with African traditional ideals. Um, basically, what? Life today is, is, is not terribly different than us, only there are exceptions to that. Um, one of them is food, and that also depends on where you are. Another is how much wealth you have. Um, basically, nowadays, uh, depending on what your job is and what you do, you can have incredible wealth. Uh, even if it doesn't feel like it. For instance, we're looking at the prices of things in a couple different places in Africa today, and like a loaf of bread is 17 cents US dollars. Uh, going to the movies in Tunisia uh, and seeing a movie from America costs about $2.17. Uh, it's, it's very, very different. Now that's cheap stuff. It's also really, really expensive stuff. For instance, a little tiny Volkswagen, like a Jetta, costs around 30 grand US in Africa. So that's brand new, by the way. Uh, there's other types of cars, obviously, available in Africa for cheaper, but some of them are things you might not necessarily think about. Uh, there's actually an episode of Top Gear where they bought cars in Africa and uh, drove them around a bit. And the one that uh, Richard Hammond had was a Minutes which was a, uh, or I mean, that was a motorcycle. Uh, I forget the name of it, actually, but it's a little Russian car that basically looks like a little go car, essentially, uh, it was about that size. But uh, it actually made the entire way. It's, it's, it's they're bulletproof, and it's keeping them running for the longest short of it. Um, and also, depends on where you are. Anyways, the point is, is that it's a mix of different things, uh, because in some places they don't have electricity either. <laughs> And again, it just really depends on where you are. And that really, really greatly influences your lifestyle. Let's look at languages for just a second, shall we? Um, so, these are the different linguistic family groups present 
in Africa. You'll notice, for instance, that Arabic, the black, is very heavily concentrated in the north, and Songhai, the blue, being heavily concentrated in central and south. Most of these are based on Bantu. So the largest language family by far is Bantu. The other thing, uh, I was going to point out, was housing. Uh, I think most people, when they think of housing in Africa, probably think something like this, yeah? This is what those look. Uh, and there are people who do, though it's much more common to have something like this. Which is pretty simple. You need, no, so you do have electricity. But, uh, uh, that does happen, but no, that's just uh, metal sheeting. So, like a tin roof, essentially. And of course, you have things like this as well. Now, it can be very, very nice. As well, that's my point, is that it really just depends. Uh, we're going to analyze a couple of different concepts when it comes to wealth. Um, the first is GNI, gross national income, which is essentially the average income within the United States or within a country based upon its GDP. And the other is. Um, the, uh, oh, Jesus, I forgot what it was a second ago. What's the national income? Uh, I'll think of the other one here. Anyways, those two numbers essentially will tell us expendable wealth for a country. G and I, gross national income. The other is per capita income. Per capita income is how much money a person makes. Okay. You guys know the difference between GDP and GNP? Chief gross national product? Okay. Okay. These are economics. The gross domestic product is essentially everything that is produced within the country that's economic value. Alright. So, in essence, how much stuff does a country have? Not only money, but how much is it producing, that sort of thing. And um, gross national product deals with that, but also like it's international businesses. If you think about it, like when you own a business in another country, it really screws up numbers like that. Because if you own a country, say, in China, or a business in a country like China, that's going to not be counted in gross domestic product, it will be gross national. So anyways, all these really tell us is how much money does a country have. Whereas per capita income is going to tell us how much dollar amount does a person on average make. For instance, do you guys know what the average income is for someone living in the United States today? It's about 30,000 US, which is why that's what I gave you to work with on your budget project. Now that's in American dollars. Once you convert that to your country's income levels, it's going to change. For instance, with my project, where I did uh, the income in Scotland, in Edinburgh, I first had to convert 30,000 US over to Great Britain pounds, and then had to withdraw from it income tax for that. Now, because Scotland is actually an independent Scotland, but also part of the United Kingdom, we actually pay taxes to both 10% each. So, all told, the United States is about 20% of uh, income tax living in Edinburgh. Uh, so, that was more or less what I had to figure out. And from there, I divided it in my 12 months, and then that's what my income is. So you'll have to do the same thing for your country. Okie dokes. Okie dokie smoking. Well, that's really it for the most part. I think I'm talking very fast recently. Oh, so, yeah, fire away. What's GNI again? GNI is gross national income. Gross means total, right? What's the other one? Uh, yes, per capita income. Oh, 
That's it then. The guys got about 10 minutes to sort of marinate.